welcome to the Color Timer podcast. I am your host, Vincent Taylor. This is the podcast where we speak to professionals who work with color. Uh, today, I am speaking to Mr. Steve Shaw. He is CEO of a company called Light Illusion, uh, although you'll see he, 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 gets a bit, he gets a bit shy when I call him CEO. Uh, he's a fascinating fella, uh, and he uh, deals... Man, how do I how do I water this down into into a couple of little bite sized sentences? It's hard, but basically, very very basically, they deal with uh, color management, color calibration, uh, that whole world of making sure that you trust what you're looking at. But uh, it's it's a great conversation. So let's go. Take your seats because the hourglass is about to turn. We are entering the world of the micro podcast. Explore the craft, creativity, and science of professionals who use color to tell stories. Welcome to The Color Timer with Vincent Taylor. Steve, hi, thank you for joining me. Pleasure, mate. Pleasure. Yeah, good to see you. I, um... I stumbled onto uh, your work because I keep seeing posts on LinkedIn and uh, instantly intrigued by by what you're working on, and so then became a little bit quietly obsessed. Uh, you are uh, you're classified as a specialist in critical color management. When I started to do some research, you, you come from a heck of a background, like you've worn a lot of hats, and uh, and I'd love to go through some stepping stones as to how you got to yeah to where you are now. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't classify myself as, as, as being the specialist in, in colour stuff. I've ended up doing colour and I happen to have um, guys that work with us that are very much specialists in colour. That, that's kind of where we've ended up. But that, that was certainly not, uh, you know, where things started out. Um, and I've been in the film and TV industry for more years than I get. Oh, yes, there you go. Yeah, for the time we're on. I, I, I otherwise, forget, otherwise I I'll forget. just waffle on forever. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 you know, what am I? I'm, I'm 59, give or take now. Um, and I started in this industry when I was 16. Wait, uh, wait, wait. So... You're 59 years old. Oh, you're looking good, mate. You're looking good. <laughs> yeah, that's lack of stress. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just happened to, to grow up. Um, in a town where at that time a young and upcoming company uh, was starting out doing the very early days of, of, of digital TV, which was Quantel. Um, and I ended up basically getting a job at the age of 16 with them rather than going to uh, you know college and university, which was the plan. I mean, you know, at that time, you know, companies actually were quite keen to get hold of people younger so they could kind of train them in this kind of new concept of digital imaging that really wasn't being taught because it didn't exist in, in you know, college universities and that. And basically went in as uh, an electronics engineer um, and ended up, you know, doing that kind of side of things for some considerable time. I, I ended up in Los Angeles um, well, actually, New York first, uh, and then LA uh, in the very early days of kind of um, things that were called Harry and Encore and what have you, the paint box and that, as uh, an engineer doing, you know, installations, doing um, service uh, work, whatever. So got into it very much from the, uh, you know, the hands on electronic side of things. Mm. And from there, it just, you know, it kind of, that was it for quite some years. And then I decided when we started getting into the, the kind of greater level of, of image image manipulation, which was, um, in my view, was film. So we got into digital film through the development of Domino uh, with Quantel. Um, and that side of it was, uh, you know, at that time pretty interesting because it was a whole new game, you know, scanning film, digitizing it, doing the visual oh, effects, yeah, putting it back to film and cutting it back into the original negative. Um, and I ended up setting up a facility or a few facilities in Soho. Men in White Coats was the first one uh, doing pretty much that kind of work. Such a great name for a company. <laughs> yeah, we you know we did a lot of work on films like Elizabeth, Lost in Space, Deep Blue Sea, things like that. Um, and, you know, it, and it was those early days. You know, we were physically handling camera original negatives, scanning it, 
you know, d doing the digital effects work, putting it back to film, and it was being spliced in, and and, and then you know the whole chain was still film. Um, I left there. Um, I to be fair, I just got fed up working in dark rooms twenty four seven for for two years. What? Um, and I actually joined. Yeah, I joined Sintel um, as technical director. Um, on the telecine side, ah. um, but it was at the end of that era. And if I'm truthful, I, I, I didn't look into um, you know what was happening with the company and the the uh, the whole film industry. And I should have known because obviously I was already working with digital cameras at that time. And uh, I I ended up in Rome at Cinecita Film Studios uh, at, at the beginning of what is now just true digital cinematography and di digital post production in the film side, in the you know, the resolutions that we now talk about as uh, uh, 3K, 4K, what have you nowadays. Um, and I was out there on and off for a good 18 months and started traveling again to act as a consultant in the same business, but all around the world. And I ended up again starting another post house called um, Axis Post in Shepparton Studios with a, another partner company, which was Axis Films, um, and you know carried on doing that side of it, but at the same time doing this consultancy work and you know bouncing around all over. I mean, I've I've worked on and off in pretty much everywhere: Africa, Japan, China, um, Hong Kong, um, you name it. I've probably been there. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and while I was doing that, we basically started, well, I started developing a, a, a very simple, uh, what was effectively a spreadsheet with, with um, VBS scripting and that to do color manipulation. And we were using it just back in the days of the Viper camera. Um, and we were working on a film, one of the um, Highlander films, which was oh. shot with Viper another film that was called silence becomes you uh, which was the very first film ever shot entirely digital uh, that wasn't video it was all captured with what were called s2 disc recorders um, in in pure digital imagery non-video wow. um, and i did a lot of work on the color science of that um, using this kind of vbs script excel spreadsheet stuff that i've been playing with for my own application and it, you know, people started to hear about it and then started to ask if they could get their hands onto it. So I ended up selling it for not a lot, but, you know, just as something to do. And effectively, that's grown into what we do today um, as Light Illusion. So now you are the CEO of Light Illusion. And uh, I had. Wow. Like, uh, well, yeah, come kinda. on. I love titles. Actually, I don't. Yeah. Um, and I had a look at the website and the home page is with graphs and numbers and it, it's like it looks awesome and it, it's such a great kind of overview of of what you guys do in just one picture you know with light illusion and what you guys are doing at the at a very base level who is it for it, i mean it's not for the people necessarily that we intended it i mean originally it was always you know we were in the professional world i mean everybody that works with us and, and i mean light illusion is is just a, a front company there, there, there are no real employees other than myself and, and my wife who is the company secretary just for legal purposes uh, the two of us um and the people we work with are, are effectively you know freelance uh, associates consultants whatever you want to call them but we've been working together for many years um uh, on you know different aspects of the product and, and it goes back to, to people that you may recognize i mean Walter Valpato, um, who's a well-known colorist in LA. Well, when I was working in Cinecitta in Rome, he was actually the engineer for Quantel uh, at the time. He was their support engineer. And because I was at Cinecitta with a guy called David Bush, who was, was well-known for, for using Quantel kit over the years, Quantel kind of sent us the early days of the um, IQ uh, system when, it, when they kind of didn't understand what they were going to do with it. So Walter would come in and kind of babysit this hardware that had just turned up that we were playing with. And, and we ended up kind of consulting with Quantel to develop the color side of IQ and turn it into the system it became. So I, I ended up doing a lot of freelance consultancy work back with Quantel at that time. Um, and Walter was very much involved with us uh, because he was there in Rome. So, you know, he, mm -hmm. he would come into Trinity because he hadn't got anything else to do. 
Um, and one of the very early IQ installations for color work was at Photochem in LA. And I went out there um, because I kind of knew it inside out because of the work I'd been doing in the development of it um, as kind of a, a trainee colorist, as in to train them up. And we did a film that was called um, oh, America Heart and Soul, which is kind of a documentary on different aspects of American life. And, and there was lots of different footage shot in different ways. And, you know, we edited it together and graded it all through the IQ. And I was the colorist on it, you know, because it was the first real kind of project that Photochem put through. But I couldn't finish the project off. So I arranged for Walter to come over. Uh, as a stand-in colorist to take over while I couldn't be there. And basically, that's how he got his start as a colorist in, in L.A. Um, and Photochem took him on full time um, at the end of the project. And, uh, you know, and obviously he's become, you know, this, this very, very, very successful colorist on the back of that. And he's done brilliantly well. But he was actively involved in the development of the early days of what is now Color Space, was then Light Space. Um, so, you know, we've, we've, we've had a whole host of different people involved in the, 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 the products mm. um, over the years, um, and many of them, you know, we are still in touch with. I lo I'm amazed to hear backstories of where, where people got their starts and, and how they ended, have kind of ended up where they are. I mean, yeah, well, Walt, Walter's amazing. Oh, yeah. You know, he, 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 tu he turned that into, you know, his own thing, and he, he's, you know, he's ended up being very good at it. But again, like me, he was an engineer. Yeah not a creative initially, but obviously he's turned out to, to be able to merge those two together in a, a very in, in impressive way. And that's kind of where I come from. You know, I'm an engineer, but I ended up doing visual effects for real. And I've, I've supervised visual effects on set. I've done the, the color grading. I've done visual effects work for real. Um, mm. So, you know, we, we've done all of that. And all of that has helped develop color space. And, and going back to your question, that was kind of where originally it was intended that it would be used by professionals for color management uh, both you know calibration of displays came a little later initially it was more about color management for uh, pipelines for workflow from camera through into um, the editing and grading side of it and the calibration side kind of has been added onto that uh, later um, which is one of the reasons we completely rewrote the program from light space to color space so that we could effectively invert it because the calibration has become a bigger part of the product rather than the color management uh, per se. But in doing that, it's ended up being used in places we never thought of. You know, we, we, we sell into medical because you know, calibration for medical displays is huge, something called DICOM. Um, home cinema users, we, we sell an extraordinary amount of software to home cinema users that want to have you know, their uh, home cinema mirroring the environment, and that includes the colour and all the rest of it, that you get in, in grading houses. Uh, so the, you know, the application uh, has grown astronomically. And then with um, with colour space, I mean, I know it's, it's, it's always so difficult to squeeze, and I knew this was going to be hard with you anyway because there's so many things I want to talk about. But if we focus on colour space for a second, uh, Someone comes to you, say, say they've got a home cinema or, or maybe they're a studio and they go, all right, we want to get this right. So where do they start in working with you? Realistically, it comes down to what level of calibration accuracy they're aiming for and realistically what their budget is. You know, the software is one part of it, but the hardware associated with that can be an even bigger part in cost terms. And at the end of the day, the measurement devices that you're using dictate the level of accuracy you can attain no matter what software you use. You know, we will obviously say that our software is the best on the planet for, for doing calibration and color workflows and things. Um, but it is always limited by the ability of the devices that you're using. That includes the display, you know, probes. Um, and, and to be fair, the actual color pipeline, you'll be surprised how many times there are distortions put into it just through having a, a, a color pipeline that just isn't configured correctly. Um, but, you know, but that's the kind of thing that we can fix. And the level of fixing is down to the end user and, you know, what they are trying to attain and how much money they actually want to spend at the end of the day. I, um, <clears throat> I've got my list of questions here. I see my sand timer. I'm going, shh. What do I, I watch? But okay, here's one. Here's a selfish one for me. 
All right. Uh, with this revolution of remote color grading, I'm constant, constantly dealing with clients who are, you know, they're not in my suite and they're looking at on, on something else. I'd love to hear your thoughts about how, how do you, uh, how do you tackle something like that when you, when you can't always manage what people are looking at things on? Yeah. I, I realistically, it's almost an impossible question. Um, because yeah. unless you have hands on with the, whatever display devices they're using, it's impossible to guess what they are, how they're set up, what their colorability really is. Um, I mean, we have clients that will send um, a, a probe, uh, you know, just a small one, just to get to get at least better. So something like a, sp a Spider X2 oh, yeah. or a, a, an I1D3 or something like that that's not overly expensive. But they're still good. You know, they're, they're, they're capable of... of, of, of you know, reasonably good color accuracy if they're managed correctly. So they'll send that to the client with um, one of our software licenses that is um, a, the low end side of it because you can remote access to it. Mm. So the post house that's got our, you know, full color space XPT or whatever, they can actually control this other version of it at the client's location with a pro oh. and they can measure the display remotely. That, that measurement data comes back to the post house in, in color space. They can actually then generate an offset LUT within color space and just burn that into the imagery before they send it to the client. They don't have to calibrate their display. They just have to know what the display is like, gotcha. what its, its parameters are. And in gotcha. doing that, you can build a, a lookup table uh, and burn mm. it into the, the, the footage ah, before you send it. That's very clever. Um, I mean, you know, that's quite common, you know, common approach nowadays. And, um, and obviously you're finding this is, well, I'm not, no, it's not obvious, but I'm assuming this is much more common now, right? Because so many more people are doing remote work. Yeah. I mean, if people are doing remote work at, where they really are, um, colluding on a project, they need to, that needs to be handled differently because they all need to know that the monitors that they're using are properly calibrated and are of a, a consistent level of capability. Mm. So in those situations, everybody involved realistically has got to be calibrating their displays. Otherwise, you, you, there's too many variables to go wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Um, and, and of course, my, my sand time has run out. Uh, but as always, I'm going to cheat and just uh, I'm going to throw one more in. And, and again, it's a, it's a selfish question. Uh, folks who have listened to my podcast have probably already gathered that I'm obsessed with black and white, which is ironic as a colorist. Um, but I want to talk to you or ask you about does calibration play a role in black and white images? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is no such thing as a black and white image. Yeah. I don't mean that in the sense that they've got chromaticity values in them because they don't. But when you're displaying them, there isn't a, a single channel that is black and white that goes for the monitor. It's still using the standard you know, RGB concept of displaying an image. It's just that it is balancing the, them out to try to neutralize the chromaticity, you know, reduce the saturation and so on. But a black and white image isn't as simple as just desaturating the color. Mm. The, the amount of red, green and blue, if you're talking about emissive displays, will actually significantly alter your perception of a black and white image because the balance dictates how much of one color is affecting the actual density of the black and white, image, as it were. Awesome. So you, st you, you can still do some seriously I interesting things with black and white by understanding the mix, the ratio mixture of the three color, ch color channels being used to generate the black and white image or to control the black and white image when you're adjusting it. I, uh, yeah, I've just got to stop myself because I've got so many more. But I'll, I'll, I'll finish off with this with this last one. Uh, so, say somebody, maybe it's a home cinema, or maybe they're a, a, a colorist uh, who are setting up their studio, and they and they want to work with you guys. So, where would they start? Obviously, they they look you guys up on the on the web, and then and then what happens normally? Someone just reaches out, I, or I guess normally they they, they email or phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but you know that's, that's because kind of it, where it goes. there's a, there's a lot of different options, right, as to what kind of services you guys can offer. Yeah, we, it, you know, if if somebody knows exactly what they want, you know, they 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 they, they they're setting up a 
the classic one. They're setting up a, a, a home studio to grade, maybe because they're doing um, uh, work that is outside of the post studio or they're doing stuff that, that, that they you know, want to work remotely at home and mm -hmm. then go in and finish yeah, it later. Yeah. And they know that they've, they've, bought, they've bought this monitor that's got you know, 3D LUT capability and it needs to be calibrated to give them a chance to be consistent with what they're doing in the post house or whatever. And they'll go, right, I need a probe, I need software, and I just get an order it, and because they know exactly what it is they need. Mm -hmm. um, but more often than not, you know, people will go, we don't know where to start. Yeah. You know, we, we, we are looking to do this. We're looking to get into doing this kind of color critical work. And we have discussions. And, and you know, dialogue is a lot of what we're about. Um, I, I mean, I the number of emails and phone calls and things that I get, you know, daily is unbelievable. But that's part of it. You know, the, the whole concept of education, training, understanding um, and getting people to realize what it is that you can do is as big a part of just making a sale mm. because it makes, the, it makes the world easier if people really understand what it is they're trying to do and how best to approach it. I mean, this, you know, talking about sales pitching, but this, this latest thing that we've literally just announced in the last few days, this thing called an image sequence probe um, is, is changing the way that you can deal with uh, virtual sets. The ability to match video walls to foreground objects such, such that the camera captures the two within the same concept oh, of color imagery has been critical. And, and we, we just kind of, you know what, we'll fix this problem. Uh, and it, it took us a week or two to, to do the software. I've got it here. I've not released it yet. It may get released today. It certainly will get released in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, it's using a camera as a probe to measure the, the video wall and make sure that what the camera sees from the video wall is the same as what it would see off the foreground objects. So you can cancel out as much as is possible the, the metameric yeah. issues between you know what are RGB LED walls and uh, foreground objects that are lit with uh, uh, better CRI lighting. Yeah. You know, there are other ways around it. Brompton are, are, are using LED walls now that have got a white pixel to, to try to infill some of the CRI value, you know, infill colors. Um, but even then, you still got to have the same approach. The camera will never see the different, you know, a, a, an emissive light uh, from an LED wall with an illuminated foreground isn't going to be seen the same. Whereas, you know, our software can fix that. Steve, you are so interesting. <laughs> I'm really, really glad that we, we quite like that. Oh, yeah. too bad, too bad. It's out there, man. Uh, uh, thank you so much, so very much for coming on the show and ha and having me, uh, you know, having this rapid chat with me. Uh, I know there's a lot to dig into, but I'm really grateful. Thank you. That's right. No problem. Cheers, mate. Steve, thank you so much for chatting to me. That was fantastic. Uh, after I hit stop on the recording, uh, we continued to chat for a bit longer about some cool stuff and I kind of wish I'd just kept it going because, yeah, a really fascinating fellow to, to speak with. Um, thank you for joining me, everybody. Uh, I will put uh, notes uh, as to where you can find all of Steve Shaw's uh, information and some of the stuff he's been working on. Thank you very much to my executive producer, MixingLight.com. If you don't know who they are, uh, they can help you all things color, MixingLight.com. To my friend of the show, Filmlight, thank you very much. Uh, to my uh, producer, Kayla, and to you, thank you for listening. Thanks so much for listening. We've got one more episode to go, and that's the end of season one. So, uh, yeah, join me next time. Thanks. See ya. The Color Timer, a micro-podcast experience.